technologies has accelerated across all of healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry is no exception. In our inaugural Invest PharmaTech event, we will be discussing several important topics underscoring this trend, be it the evolution of clinical trials or how AI is being leveraged in drug discovery. But first, we must begin by exploring the future of digital medicines. Several initiatives have made great strides here. Think of Akili Labs and its FDA cleared Endeavor RX that uses video games to improve cognitive function. But there are some failures too, and especially around collaborations between pharma and digital health. Think of Proteus Digital Health and its embedded sensor in Otsuka's depression drug that never saw great adoption and ultimately Proteus shut down. So where does the sector go from here? To get answers to these thorny questions and get a glimpse into the future, let's meet our panel. We have Carrie Northcott from Pfizer, Lana Ganem from Hikma Ventures, Pierre Laurent from Aptar Pharma, Mario Morera from uh, Emergent. Mario is one of our sponsors, so thank you so much, Mario. And Abhishek Shah with Wealthy Therapeutics. Carrie is a senior director project lead within digital medicine and translation imaging, early clinical development at Pfizer. She leads a driven and diverse team that is evaluating and validating the use of wearable digital devices to more fully understand and characterize physiological endpoints such as quantitatively measuring nighttime sleep. Carrie has a diverse scientific background in pharmacology, toxicology, and physiology, which provides unique insight into understanding how these novel digital endpoints provide meaningful information to patients, doctors, and researchers to better treat and understand diseases. Welcome, Carrie, to the panel. Next up, we have Lana Ganem, Managing Director of Hikma Ventures. She helped establish this in 2015. Lana started her career at Hikma Pharmaceuticals in 2012 as the assistant to the CEO and director of corporate strategy and development. In this role, she worked on strategic projects across the company's various functions, including strategy, M&A, operations, and finance. Lana co-founded the Innovation and Leadership Advisory Board at Hikma. She holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and a Bachelor's of Commerce degree from McGill University. She is a board member of Senora Food Industries and an investment committee member of AB Ventures, the corporate VC arm of Arab Bank. Welcome to you, Lana. Pierre Laurent, CEO and co-founder of Volantis, an Aptar Pharma company, has over 20 years of experience in digital health in the United States and Europe. Prior to starting Volantis, Pierre worked at GE Medical Systems in its medical imaging software division and at Health Center Internet Services, a vendor of EMR solutions based in Silicon Valley. He's the founding director of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, which he served as ch chairman and is a member of AdvaMed's Digital Health Executive Leadership Group. Pierre previously co-chaired the Digital Therapeutics Task Force of the Personal Connected Health Alliance, a member of HIMSS and chaired the eHealth France Alliance. He holds an MS from Ecole Centrale Paris. Welcome to you, Pierre. Mario Morera is a principal consultant with Emergent and has almost two decades worth of experience applying, applying agile in the enterprise. He focuses on enabling digital transformation for companies within the pharmaceutical industry and has recently helped clients improve their time to market for drug development. Mario has spoken in numerous conferences and webinars across the globe and has written four Agile books, including the Agile Enterprise. Mario, welcome to Invest PharmaTech. And last but not least, we have Abhishek Shah. He is the co-founder and CEO of Wealthy Therapeutics. Abhishek has more than a decade of healthcare experience and is a thought leader in digital therapeutics in Asia. He's a former VC and, and has held leadership positions in a media conglomerate. UTV that is now part of Disney and his healthcare family businesses. He founded Wealthy Therapeutics with the realization of the need for a care continuum in a healthcare system that has been historically designed for episodic care. Welcome to you, Abhishek. 
Before I turn it over to Carrie, I wanted to mention that the audience can pose questions in the chat and Carrie will weave them in as she feels appropriate. Over to you, Carrie. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited about today's session. Um, I get to be the moderator, usually I'm on the other side. So um, I'm really looking forward to discussing digital medicine and digital therapeutics with this great group of panelists. I think they bring a diverse set of insight. And um, for me, I'm very excited because they bring an insight that I typically don't talk a lot with during my day-to-day -day job. As you greatly introduced, um, I come from more of the research and development side within pharma of the digital endpoints. And I'm really excited to hear about um, our panelists' thoughts as we move forward. So one thing I like to do as um, we start is really kind of level set. Um, one thing I've learned within uh, digital medicine field and digital therapeutics is the word digital means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. <laughs> so um, as we get into today's discussions, I wanted to level set and understand what the panelists actually thought the phrase digital therapeutics means and what it means to them um, with regards to what we're talking about today. So I am going to start, I'm just gonna randomly pick, um, Abhishek, you're in my top corner, so I'm gonna pick on you. What does digital therapeutics mean to you? What is it? I think great question. We've got uh, a lot of varying definitions. I'm not gonna to go to what the DTA has, has so amazingly set out for everyone. I think what we found digital therapeutics to mean is how do we use clinically validated software as a medical device to be able to deliver um, for unmet patient needs, both clinical and quality of life, and do it in a manner in which it's reproducible, scalable, effective, safe, and can be regulated and in the hands of patients and caregivers that matter. So I'm just simplifying it for, for, for our world, where we found that this is tremendously useful as we look to drive health equity for all. What a wonderful definition. Way to go. We need to record that. Thank you. Um, any of other panelists have any other thoughts to add to that? Or are we all good to go and we level set? I think we level set, but I think, I mean, just to kind of, uh, I, I always like to say it's kind of the converge, convergence of uh, software and healthcare uh, to, to kind of sum, sum it up. And it basically, you know, aims to prevent, manage, and, and or, or potentially treat diseases. Uh, by you know uh, having kind of a, a more I would say patient centric way that's more engaging and enables the patients to take uh, full control of, of of their lives and how they you know manage the disease. Yeah, and to add to that, when discussing digital therapeutics, we have to acknowledge that digital transformations within an organization must occur, and this usually involves an, an awareness of agile ways of working. Historically, Agile has been in the tech space, but we need to start seeing it more in the business space because that's where pharma can take more advantage of agility and faster ways of working, adapting to change and more quickly aligning with the needs of the market. Gary, you're on mute, just so you know. Yes, and there are different categories of digital therapeutics. You know, some of them are like standalone, you know, therapies that can act as you know substitute to drug treatments, and others are more like companions to existing therapies. So uh, I think during our discussion today, we'll probably uh, you know spend some time to deep dive the second category as we uh, see great value in extending uh, the drugs uh, with uh, these digital companions. Absolutely, it gets complicated fast. So. I know in the past several years, there's been a, a with COVID, there's been amplification of telehealth, um, as well as we're seeing a lot more integration and push towards the digital mindset. I know from the farmer perspective, I'm continually being asked now, what can I add to my study? What can I add to my study in digital? What can I do remote? Um, so we're really seeing a shift, at least I am in, in my space, in uh, the push to move to more digital medicine, digital therapeutics, digital monitoring in the healthcare industry. What can we do at home to understand more? So as a whole, what kind of impact are digital therapeutics making right now in healthcare? And it's a multi-part question, so be patient. Um, what kind of uh, impact are they making right now in healthcare, right now? Um, and I wanna ask about it from different points of view, from the patient 
physician as well as the investor, because I know that's part of the focus of today's meeting. And also, so right now, and where do you think it's going to go in two, five, 10 years? I know that's a really loaded question, but I'm really kind of curious to hear your thoughts. And Mari, I'm going to pick on you because uh, you're right there. So uh, any thoughts to this? Uh, at Emergen, we advance the notion of experimentation. So all of this, as the world is changing, we're seeing rapid change, COVID comes in and disrupts us. We need to recognize that experimentation is a big part of the picture here. We have lots of unknowns, disruptions, and even competition. And while pharma science is steep in experimentation, it's bringing that mindset to the business side to understand that we're ripe for opportunities. However, opportunities come and go. And so looking at it from an investor perspective, they're always going to look to see, have you defined your experiment? What is it you're trying to achieve? Is it really going to help the patient? And so looking at that, everybody has to really start supporting the concept of discovery mindset as we move forward, because it needs to be data-driven, incremental, and explicit in the way we're working so that we can ensure we're moving in the direction of value for the patient. So that gives you a summary or a platform of where we need to go. I'm sure others will provide much more detail. Yeah, well, when it comes to impact, I think uh, you know it's great to see a number of you know, very interesting use cases uh, across a number of therapeutic areas. So uh, you know, personally, I'm very excited about you know certain areas where we have demonstrated that digital therapeutics can bring value. So, uh, you know, for instance, I can mention a few examples, uh, you know, in oncology, you know, our solutions can help patients better self-manage the symptoms that they experience, you know, the way of their treatment. We can, you know, provide them with, you know, re recommendations to tell them what, you know, they should be doing when these symptoms occur. So that helps with the management of side effects of certain therapies. We also, you know, bring the patients closer to their healthcare team remotely, you know, so that we can, uh, you know, help uh, have a more proactive way of managing diseases, and uh, ultimately that you know will translate into a, you know a better way of managing patients on the healthcare professional side, but also ultimately uh, for you know in savings for payers as we might uh, be uh, you know uh, decreasing unnecessary uh, hospitalization on ER visits, uh, for instance. So uh, I think there is value uh, in each of these you know therapeutic areas to uh, align uh, interests of the different stakeholders. Uh, a number of other other great examples in diabetes, in respiratory disease, or in mental health, which is a, you know, a very large space for digital therapeutics. Oh, absolutely, Pierre. Uh, just to add on to what Pierre said, uh, what we're finding is uh, digital therapeutics now, at least, uh, are evolving to not just solve for the unmet needs of the patients, both quality of life or clinical, but are also able to look at simultaneously, how can you drive down cost of care? How can you reduce the HCP burden? How can you spend in you know, a meaningful part, be a meaningful part of the patient journey? And then to Pierre's point, I think we've been really fortunate to see exactly that right in, in uh, recurring pregnancy loss, where we're focusing on, we've shown an improvement in quality of life of women who are um, you know, looking to pregnant and looking to conceive all the way through to uh, diabetes, all the way through to lung cancer and rheumatoid arthritis, where between symptom management and quality of life, we're able to demonstrate that clinical efficacy and improvement in outcomes, right? So in first, I'd say the evolution is caused for multi-stakeholder outcomes versus sing single stakeholder outcomes. I think that's a, that's a key one, which I'm really, really excited about. And through that, um, not just demonstrating um, clinical and quality of life, but going all the way to business ROI and are able to now demonstrate not just the HOER data, uh, cost of care data, but also start asking the fundamental question, what's the business ROI as we get companions to pair with drugs so that life science companies can generate the same uh, business metrics while at the same time solving for the unmet needs. I think that's really, really powerful as a place to be as we get into the second half of 2022. Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to be redundant. I think everything was, was covered by my fellow panelists, but I mean, I think one thing that wasn't mentioned from the patients, and I think it improves adherence, like that's one of the things that I guess, you know, we've invested in companies like Propeller Health, Nuvo Air, Abhishek mentioned, and, and Pierre mentioned respiratory being, you know, one area that's, you know, a key focus in digital therapeutics. The other aspect from the physician end, I think is, 
one uh, remote monitoring. The other one is the data that's collected and analyzed to eventually um, uh, provide personalized treatments for patients. So we're, you know, through these tools and platforms where, you know, the provider is coming closer to the patient, uh, we're hopefully going to reach a point where, you know, we can really customize each, each treatment to each patient. And this is what digital therapeutics is, is essentially enabling. Yes. And Carrie, regarding your question about investors, you know, I think, uh, you know, there, we are at the you know, early stages of, uh, you know, very large new industry sector. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think that, you know, we are inaugurating, uh, let's say, new treatment modalities, you know, uh, alongside drugs on uh, traditional medical devices. So uh, we, 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 we are, let's say, uh, the uh, early companies in what is going to be, uh, you know, uh, a very large industry moving forward. So uh, I think investors are interested in probably uh, being at the, uh, at the forefront uh, of, uh, you know, one of the, let's say, uh, sectors that has the uh, highest, uh, you know, uh, uh, growth uh, prospects for the future. I think we're seeing that with the adoptions of the digital watches, with the adoptions of the apps, and these things are becoming second nature. Um, how many steps did you walk? The competitions, we're seeing that from the patients and others. So this kind of somewhat leads into my next question. Um, and I'm asking this it's easy to give a very quick answer, but I'm really curious what your thoughts are. Who's driving these changes? Is it the patient that's going to drive it? Um, is it pharma? Is it going to be tech companies that are driving it? Is it um, the healthcare uh, community as a whole, the physicians? Um, who, who's going to push us forward in this space? Lana, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> I think it's, it's a collaborative effort, to be honest, like one hand doesn't clap alone, right? Uh, I know it's, yep. it's a very, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's the answer, it's, it's the typical answer that a lot of people would, uh, you know, uh, use, but I think it requires payers to, you know, uh, be open to pilots with with these you know companies and to eventually get them reimbursed, uh, get these services and, and offerings reimbursed. Um, it, it, it requires, you know, these very innovative startups who are nimble and coming up with innovative ideas to, you know, continue, um, you know, striving towards, you know, building these technologies. It requires investors who can, you know, provide the financial support uh, to these creative startups and the ecosystem. Um, regulators alike, I mean, one area that's, I, I guess, a, a hindrance, hindrance sometimes is, Right, with the regulatory kind of authority. So, you know, making sure that they prioritize these and not kind of delay meetings with, with these uh, companies, make sure that it's, you know, on top of, of, of uh, the agenda every year. And finally, like as a pharma investor, corporate VC investor, like it's the pharma companies, uh, like we, you know, have a big responsibility to actually partner with these companies, pilot with them, because this is what's going to provide them with more evidence, more data. So we need to kind of, take that, uh, you know, uh, leap of faith and, and, and uh, you know, partner with them, not just invest as well. Yeah, I would echo what Lana said. I, just uh, for your information, I mean, the very first uh, partner we had at Voluntis was a patient association. So it's, I think, uh, an interesting uh, uh, view that, uh, you know, uh, patients have been, uh, you know, looking at uh, also new ways of uh, improving, you know, uh, experience with the treatments on improving outcomes in general so uh, i think uh, we are we are we we, we, are, we have seen a number of groups you know uh, innovate at the first place i think uh, visionary leaders in the patient community with also visionary uh, leaders from the clinical community uh, teaming up with startups and also i think we have seen early examples of pharma companies that uh, you know were interested in taking these innovations to scale and uh, that's why we have we have started to see some interesting new types of partnership uh, between uh, digital companies on uh, on pharma that mimic a little bit, you know, what biotech companies have done with with life sciences companies before. So, I think you know at, there are different let's say ways to engage in the space. And uh, on pharma is really well well placed, I think, to help scale some of these innovations across the world. And when I was working with some pharma companies recently, we got a lot of pull signals actually from doctors who are very interested in how to better relate to their clients to get them the therapeutics they need. And so they're trying to figure out how to get the information uh, for themselves as well as information to their patients to make a better connection. And of course, 
to obviously provide the uh, benefit that the client patients do need. And so you do see pull signals coming from a lot of different areas. You know, I always like to sum up as it's going to be the people who have the most, what I call agile or discovery mindset, the ones who are knowing that the world is changing. And so whichever area you're going to be in, you know that the world is changing in the last couple of years really, uh, you know, illustrated that. And so that sort of mindset is going to be extremely important, whether if you're like on a board of directors, you have to in inject that into the board and to the larger companies in particular. Investors tend to have it just because they're always looking for the latest and they understand the, the data that's going to be needed to prove it out and things like that. Patients these days are becoming more and more inpatient, if you know what I mean, for their 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 data. You know, it's it's great that you can now get it a lot of it online, but it's not always been that way. And so I think it's going to be those people who have the greatest discovery mindset and that pull that's going to really push, you know, push the envelope. Yep. No, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Mario, Pierre, and Lana. Uh, I think everything's covered. The one thing I'd call out is um, since we, we we get the privilege of seeing things from a global perspective, um, as we operate in um, the US, the EU, and in Asia, uh, maybe the one person that one or a stakeholder is um, when you, you look at, let's say, emerging markets, you're seeing actually a, a very clear um, emphasis on change coming from the customer, the user, the patient. Um, and they're enabling and they're pushing the entire equation to leapfrog. And I think that is something in our quest for health equity, we're seeing incredible learnings that we're able to not just imbibe, but then bring that back into other markets. So I just call out that if you zoom out to a global lens, uh, the patient does have a larger voice than in some of the other markets. And that's really inspiring to see as we you know, help healthcare leapfrog into a world where digital therapeutics is in the standard of care. I think I'll echo everybody here. I do agree that there's a partnership and coming from the pharma side, I see that um, that's really needs to happen. And I'm very excited to see that patients are now being more involved in these decisions and discussions moving forward um, to the point of, hey, what do you think about this? Would you try this? Would you do that? But also I think pharma is uniquely poised to be able to collect a lot of that validation and verification data that we always discuss in digital medicine. It just can't be untested. And that was something I was quite tickled to be honest, coming from my point of view in this space is hearing that everyone agreed that the digital therapeutics and medicines need to be validated and verified and, and actually mean something at the end. And I think we're uniquely poised in those partnerships to um, contribute to that. So as they're being developed, having those conversations with patients, the, the digital tech companies and the pharma to how to deploy and collect that data to demonstrate it's what it's doing. Sorry, I had to add my two cents there because that's something I was just excited to hear. And I agree, it is definitely going to be a partnership. So we've talked about the partnership and the happy, and I always hear about that, which is great. And I'm a big proponent of that myself. What is the major obstacle that you see in this space? So let's flip the coin. Let, where, where's the tough point? Um, where are we going with that? Uh, Pierre, I don't think I've started with you. So do you have any ideas? What's that big um, problem that we're all going to butt our heads against or are already butting our heads against? I mean, in many cases, in many conversations in the space, people would say reimbursement is the number <laughs> one you know, topic you know, uh, that prevents you know, uh, mass adoption of this technology. So I, uh, I partially agree. I think it's a very important topic, but uh, there are also a few others. Uh, so I mean... Uh, uh, I think when I think about reimbursement, I think about uh, two kinds of reimbursement. I, the first one is for the solutions themselves. And the second one is for the healthcare professionals who uh, prescribe and use uh, some of these products. So I think we need to make sure that both, you know, are uh, set, put in place adequately in all the different markets where we want to uh, roll out these solutions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm saying partially just also because some solutions don't necessarily require a reimbursement to, uh, you know, to get to market and to uh, to gain mass adoption. So it really depends on the go-to-market strategy. Uh, sometimes, you know, we are now going to see some 
using hybrid products, you know, combining drugs on digital, and may maybe that's the new form of the drug, uh, you know, simply put. So you don't necessarily uh, require to have a separate reimbursement in addition to the drug. But anyway, so we are starting to see, uh, you know, new reimbursement pathways uh, in different markets, you know, uh, to also cover the new act activities by healthcare professionals when they want to engage into remote monitoring of these patients. So I'm very encouraged by to see that, you know, in uh, countries like the US, you know, Germany, France, for example, we start to see uh, frameworks at the, na at the national level uh, to facilitate the adoption uh, of these technologies. Uh, a few days ago, one of the nationwide payers in uh, in Europe, you know, mentioned the fact that they are they were welcoming the uh, uh, development of a new category alongside, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, a traditional medical device to have, you know, digital therapeutics well identified as a new category of medical products. So I think, you know, we're getting more like institutionalized, you know, uh, every day. So, uh, you know, in addition to reimbursement, I would say that there is a still a, lo uh, a lot of, you know, room to educate the marketplace about the existence on the, of these solutions. If you look at, you know, different uh, kinds of market research that were done in different countries, you know, recently, the vast majority of healthcare professionals still don't know about these products. You know, they are not uh, familiar with them, even if they say that in the future, they might, you know, be ready to prescribe them or to utilize them in their practice. I think there is a still, a, you know, a massive need for education education uh, about you know this this new category and we need to make it simple uh, to use in their in their daily practice so that's that's another area i think where the industry needs to provide better solutions it's interoperability because you know for you know, uh, if we uh, if we see a, a, a you know the, the let's say a future where you know digital therapeutics are prescribed you know seamlessly by healthcare professionals in their practice you know it has to come uh, very simply in their you know daily uh, you know let's say practice management system so they don't need to use 50 different sol you know the solutions for 50 50 different kinds of digital therapeutics. So, you know, as an industry, we need to collaborate to make it very simple uh, to use these products and to fit within existing workflows. So those are just a couple examples of some hurdles that we are all facing, I think, uh, that we need to that we need to provide, uh, you know, answers at, as an industry. Yeah, I think another set of obstacles are innovation is always ahead of regulatory, right? We're hitting that wall and regulatory needs to understand where it's headed. And uh, we've already talked about that we're in a uh, innovative field where, where everything is early adopter, everything is new, and to have regulatory start to catch up, to understand not just what is being developed, but how do you regulate it? And so I think there can be some obstacles related to that. And so that's something that's going to need to be explored. In addition, and I see someone put a comment on this is, who owns the data? If you have multiple groups involved in the therapeutic, who owns the data? How do you keep it secure? And things like that. So that could have an impact on the work ahead. Yeah, just moving on, Pierre and, and Mario uh, mentioned, Carrie, that especially Pierre, like you mentioned, education. And I think um, uh, with regards to that, like I think clinical validation sometimes is, is an obstacle here because, because there are many, uh, I guess, apps, bottom apps or platforms that are wellness apps I do not really use clinical validation. It kind of uh, uh, sets the stage for everyone else. And, and you know, if you have an investor or even like uh, more importantly, a patient or a provider that's looking at these platforms and they see, you know, that oh, like this, like there's no clinical evidence, then they wouldn't actually put, uh, you know, any time or effort in looking at anything that has that clinical ev uh, evidence and, you know, uh, uh, companies that have, you know, been there, done that, have, have gathered all the data. So they get kind of penalized in the process. So it's very important to educate everyone and, and differentiate between, you know, companies that are adopting the wellness approach and ones that are really doing all the hard work and building on kind of a clinically uh, kind of uh, um, proven, you know, uh, platform. And I, I guess, you know, just to add on to that, it's, you know, we as investors, like we receive a lot of decks, right? Like, and a lot of these companies have this cookie cutter approach. It's so hard. Like sometimes when we think about pitching them to our investment committee, like I struggle. I'm like, I really need to find like the moat. I need to find, you know, what's really different and differentiating about this uh, company. So that's another obstacle from the investment investor side, right? Like it, it, these companies really need to focus a lot on that, you know, validation and making sure that they, they are providing something that is different. 
I always use the example, I had a fitness tracker and I'm not going to name names, but I accidentally left it in my pocket when I dried it in the dryer and it gave me 7,000 steps. And I said, if I was, and by the way, I'm a scientist. So I did it multiple times in FYI, their algorithm was tuned and I got 7,000 steps. So it worked great in my competition, but from a health point of view, it isn't something I'd want for diagnosis or treatment. So that is one of the things I always give an example when I give a talk. I want to make sure whatever I'm doing is measuring exactly what it's supposed to be measuring and not measuring how well my dryer is walking. So that's a great point. And, and there is clearly a definition, a differentiation between the two. Uh, I say a lot of times what I work on are things that are, are really something that doctor can use. Um, the others are very good and they have their place. I'm not saying they don't, but um, it's something when I'm making those medical-based decisions, I want to make sure that everything is validated and accurate to the best of the point. So I, I love that question in the, in the chat too. And I wanted to follow up. So who does own the data? The, the easy answer is the patient. But, um, you know, a, a lot of these uh, companies that are coming, validation is very important. And to do that, you have to have data. So, so who owns it? Or should, who should own it? So who owns it? Who should own it? Or is there a way that we could make it accessible? Or how do we proceed in that space? Any thoughts or ideas? Oh, we're going to go quiet now. I think anyone that adds value, right? Uh, my short answer is, okay, the patient owns it, but then yeah. every person in the system adds something to it, right? So the pharma companies are enablers, so they should get that piece of the pie and be able to use that data in whatever is beneficial for them. Uh, um, uh, other part is, is you know, payers uh, as well. Um, you know, the, obviously the, the startup itself that's coming up with the algorithms, the AI, machine learning, etc. So I think different people have to have different pieces of the pie, but like at the end, at the end of the day, the, you know, the ultimate provider is the patient, I guess. Mm -hmm. Also, it depends, I think, on the go-to-market strategies of the different players. I mean, deep, for example, uh, in our case, we partner a lot with pharma. So in this case, you know, you need to define exactly the roles and responsibilities of each party, you know, in the relationship. And, uh, you know, that's one of the key topics that is, you know, being discussed. And, uh, there are different variations of, you know, who owns the data in these different agreements according to, uh, you know, the, the situation, the intent of the parties and, and so on. But it's typically, uh, you know, defined, uh, you know, uh, between the groups on, uh, as you mentioned, at the individual level, you know, the patients in, in most countries are also uh, owners of their, of their data. And, and we also have to understand that data is not a monolith, right? Data is a lot of different things, right? And it could be from the financial data to the health data and so forth, scheduling data. And so what aspects of data are, are actually owned by who? And of course, the short answer is it is the patient but there's also then the providers of that data. And that's not the patient, that's the patients are the receiver of the data. So looking at that complexity is going to be important to really provide the right answer to, to what we're asking. So I can tell you how the current answer is right now, which is we'll look at the annex shares of each one of our agreements with the enterprise partners, and you will find a laundry list of, uh, of data-oriented uh, clauses, and rightly so. I think uh, to to all my fellow co-panelists' point, I think it's a complex topic. Uh, one thing is for sure, everyone wants uh, a piece of it, and everyone to a large extent, because they have a role to play, should sort of uh, get it as well. We just need to figure out with the patient as one of the owners, uh, how do we navigate these waters? I think for the longest part, we've solved this right now through the go-to-market strategy of ours, which is to working with enterprise partners, payers and pharma, and therefore the contracts govern it. But I think this is an evolving subject. I don't think it is a, is a document that is set in stone, it continues to remain live and we evolve as the market evolves. Yeah. On beyond ownership, you need, you need to think about the different, you know, use usage, uh, you know, of the, of the data. For example, I mean, you, you we need data also analysis to continuously refine our solutions. You know, we need data to uh, measure the impact of our solutions in the real world. We need uh, data to uh, help also assess the economical impact of our solutions. We need data to uh, for uh, you know device vigilance purposes. We need data for many different types of, of uses. So you don't necessarily have to own it uh, to make good use. 
of the data also uh, you know under the obviously uh, you know uh, uh, regulations that are you know now pretty well defined in uh, in uh, in many countries and also uh, according to uh, to the partnership uh, framework that you have in place I think it's a topic that gets very complicated again very quickly. The patient, I agree, owns the data, but uh, typically, depending on how it was collected, someone is the custodian of that data. And there's also fiscal responsibilities to protect it, as well as maintain that. And all of that uh, is complicated. So I think there's going to be some, and, and I think it's a great conversation. I also want to be cognizant that we've only got 25 more minutes. And I think we could probably spend uh, weeks just talking about um, uh, that aspect of, of that uh concept and also uh, who who's responsible who's liable and do they fully understand as well I mean and there's a lot of discussions in that space as well I'm going to change the topic just slightly it still deals with data and apps etc but I do want to ask this um, and it's something I hear from patients when we speak with them as well as others I, I look at my phone right now and I've got pages and pages of apps including healthcare apps and every uh, healthcare company has their own app has their own platform by which to use and I I think this is one of the challenges um, we're going to face as we move forward. Do you see this multi-platform digital preferences continuing, or do you think there'll ever be a common platform that we come to? I, I personally believe that you'll see more and more, more and more collaborations between you know parties, uh, also mm -hmm. to facilitate in integration with, between different kinds of solutions. So uh, I think you you start you see still a lot of point you know solutions addressing you know very specific use cases, but uh, you know I'm pretty sure that we'll we'll have less and less silos in the future, and all these different solutions will uh, you know talk to uh, to other uh, platforms. Uh, so um, I'm pretty convinced that interoperability is here to stay and is going to you know to grow uh, very significantly uh, in the coming years. But at the same time, I think you know that patients have you know need to uh, uh, to help to to be uh, supported in uh, managing certain issues at a certain time in their treatment journey. So uh, if you are able to provide you know uh, valuable solutions to help them through their daily challenges, I think they will be receptive and be ready to use you know. A preferred app at a certain time, you know, for certain uh, benefits. Uh, so those are my two cents. Yeah, in general, yeah. patients want a one-stop shop, right? They they just want to go to one platform or one app and get everything they need. So we do have to recognize that that, from a, a patient perspective, that's going to be important. However, there's a back-end challenge here, and that's every app that gets created is created with a wholly separate architecture and stack, you know tiers and stacks of different technologies. And so coming to some agreement on that is going to be important. And it's very challenging because even if you have the agreement, which of course is going to be very challenging, it's just actually getting the technology stacks aligned across the different platforms and things like that. And so I think that's just another aspect of this that uh, is going to have to be considered. I think you know it's also an invitation. I think for the sector to evolve uh, more towards like platforms in general. Uh, so I, you know, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, in our case at Aptar, I mean, that's what we're building. Also, you know, a platform, uh, you know, combining both software and hardware capabilities. Uh, you know, now we 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 want to have, a, let's say, a portfolio of you know different solutions working, uh, you know, on the same, uh, let's say, frameworks. Uh, also on, uh, so I think you'll you'll start to see, uh, uh, you know, a number of solutions being operated by uh, the. I mean, a limited number of uh, of large scale industrial platforms in the future, and that that will help, you know, decomplexify a bit, you know, this challenge of uh, of interoperability I mentioned before. And as we solve for interoperability, which I completely agree with Pierre, the other part of it, which the way we see it is, uh, the higher the utility quotient, uh, the lesser the need for it to be part of a larger sort of super app or a super platform. Uh, but more and more, you're going to find that platforms is the way to go because not every product is going to have that higher utility that a patient will want it, uh, you know, in their universe of apps on their phone and then continuously use it for a duration of time. Um, there is digital fatigue that has already set in and it's about to get worse. Uh, so we are going to see that consolidation but between platforms, interoperability, and really... Um, as the patient becomes the judge and jury, uh, 
they're, the great part is they're merciless. Uh, they're not going to continue using a product that doesn't provide utility or a great user experience for them. And that's just a phenomenal place to be able to ensure that um, you know, the, the good ones stay, the high utility ones stay, but most will move into a platform or a integrated app approach supported with interoperability at the back. What great answers. I'm enjoying the session a lot. Um, I hope, I'm seeing a lot of comments, so it's great to see. Um, one of the things I kind of want to circle back, Mara, you mentioned it, Pierre, earlier too, is that there are some that are lagging behind in this partnership. So I agree it's a partnership amongst all stakeholders. Um, uh, pharma, scientists, device manufacturers. Um, I don't want to forget the, the internet and the, the storage and the providers and the respect of who's hosting all of this data because it's sheer amounts. I joke that I've broken several data transfer systems already in my work alone, um, being able to move it, patients, physicians, payers, regulators. Not everyone's quite yet on the same page. And I think that's been highlighted earlier. So how do we bring some of those people forward. And, you know, I think Mario, you highlighted that regulators are, are lagging a little bit right now. So how do you suggest we, we bring them uh, as part of the team into the, the fold a little more? Um, what type of suggestions do you all have? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just start with, there's really two things that we often will approach it with. And first is just to provide an end-to-end -end view of all of those players you just mentioned. We're in the full end-to-end -end life cycle of development should everybody play? And so that way you can visualize where everybody plays and understand who are the key stakeholders. So you know who you need to work with sooner than later. The other thing we provide is what we call an education platform. And so because everybody's at different levels of learning, you have to initiate an, an education engine to get everybody up to speed because innovators such as the people on this panel are always gonna be ahead of the curve. They're gonna be able to speak language that a lot of people are not. And when you have an end-to-end -end view of all the stakeholders involved, you need to bring that learning engine to the table. So everybody's at least at the same level so they understand what we're talking about across the life cycle. And so that's gonna be important to ensure that there's education for certain groups of stakeholders along the way so they understand what's really happening here so they can make the most of the opportunity and so people can be integrated and work together. I appreciate that integration comment and the education because let's simplify it. Um, I work on uh, nocturnal scratch and measuring that. And if you keep every group siloed along the way, the solution at the end doesn't look like what you think it's going to be. So we were as simple as discussing what is a scratch and data scientists looked at data and said, this is what I can identify. This is you know how accurate I can be. And I remember I was sitting there going, but is that physiologically relevant? So yes, five seconds scratching. That's great. I'm glad you can identify that. But now let's count five seconds. That's a long time. Is that really relevant? So having all the stakeholders present, regulators coming in, technical, all of it at one table and having the integration education is so important for it to come up with a solution at the end. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something that looks like a duck when you meant to measure sleep. So you need to make sure those old parties. Pierre, I saw you came off mute. Do you have any thoughts or additions? I mean, uh, I think we, I mean, we realized uh, several years ago that we needed, you know, new places also to collaborate as, a, as an industry. So that's, you know, what also drove the creation of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, for example. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think we need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, in, you know, industry-wide collaboration across stakeholders. And I think the DTA, since its formation, has done a great job at, you know, as first, you know, putting, like, say, let's say, strong foundations for the sector, you know, with a lot of work on the, you know, definition for example now it's more like for example towards uh, more common standards for reimbursement like uh, developing value guides that can be used by HTA uh, you know, bodies in different countries to uh, help them evaluate uh, you know the impact of digital therapeutics in a harmonized way and there is a lot of work to be done because each country has their own views of how you know they define or or, or, or view these different solutions so uh, we need to have global organizations to help us you know connect the dots and also uh, you know help uh, develop standards uh, at scale to facilitate the adoption of, uh, of these technologies. And that within each country, there, are, there, are, there is also a need for specific subgroups. Uh, and I think we, uh, we start to, uh, to see that you know, working pretty well in certain K-12 
cases uh, when uh, when we see the results in the form of, for example, some uh, some reimbursement pathways being uh, being put in place, or some let's say national standards, for example, for interoperability that are being defined by ministries of health. That's very helpful, and that's uh, pretty new. And uh, we need to continue doing the, you know this great collaborative work. That leads well into my next question and thought. Um, one big promise I hear about digital medicine, therapeutics, um, and digital biomarkers, et cetera, is it provides many opportunities for health equity, um, being able to capture um, areas that haven't traditionally been captured in this space. I personally grew up in a very rural environment, and I can see how um, digital medicine has many advantages. My family travels two, three hours to go to a, a physician, um, and, and the capability and possibilities of using digital medicine to monitor and, and those types of environments and other types of, of income as well as cultures, I think is, is a phenomenal one. Um, so do you believe this as well? Is this something that we think we can span beyond just the traditional um, pockets and centers that we have clinical trials at now or digital adoption. You know, I, I joke around that, you know, in, in Boston, in New York, et cetera, you, you don't see any, many, very few people have a digital watch, but it have, when you go into some of the more rural areas or uh, various reservations, et cetera, it, it's a lot different story. So do you think this may be one of those bridges that'll be able to help fix this? And if so, how do you envision that occurring? So for us, where a huge I fan you were of, smiling, but of, I think you stole on my screen. Do you have any thoughts? Can you hear me? All right. All right. So I sorry, I was yes. just saying that uh, it, this is the, the entire mission of our organization, right? Where we get to drive health equity using this. So uh, we've seen in front of our eyes that the same platform that digital therapeutics um, uh, powers, that same platform can power. Um, standalone prescription digital therapeutics, companions with claims, complements without claims, remote patient monitoring, patient support. You can do so much. Integrating digital biomarkers, integrating connected devices. When you actually look at the utility that um, platforms like this can provide, use cases that can unlock on the back of that, whether it's diagnosis as a use case or it is support for surveillance or patient care or healthcare at home, um, we believe, and we're seeing this in front of our eyes, that um, there is really an opportunity fundamentally using software as a medical device delivered as a companion in the hands of every patient to be able to um, deliver high quality personalized care into the hands of every individual, which historically has been available only to a select few people. Uh, and it is, it is digital therapy platforms, digital care mechanisms, um, which may or may not have a clinical claim attached to it, uh, that can fundamentally solve for so much of that. And we're extremely grateful to be you know, in the middle of it and to be able to drive our mission forward. So we're big fans. We see health equity as our single largest mission. Yeah, I agree with uh, with Abhishek. From uh, it's interesting to see kind of you know the the startup uh, you know perspective. Uh, like from the investor perspective, like for us as a cross border investor, like you know I'm I'm based in Jordan. We 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 invest globally, and predominantly most of our portfolio companies are in North America. However, as Hikma, we're the largest regional players in the Middle East and North Africa. And the reason we established the corporate VC arm was to invest in companies in the West that are coming up with these very innovative, um, you know, platforms and bring these technologies to, uh, you know, uh, our neck of the woods, so to the Middle East and, and North Africa. And one example is we invested in a company called Winter uh, Winter uh, Winter Light Labs, which uh, develops focal biomarkers. And now uh, Hikma partnered with them. Uh, they're and it was seamless, right? Cross border, Canada to Jordan, Saudi, Egypt, um, and uh, KSA. And now we're doing, you know, this uh, this trial with KOLs, and they're Arabizing the platform, and we're planning to use it on schizophrenia patients in the Middle East. Uh, so it's it's not something that's tangible per se, but like it just requires like an an, an iPad, and then you know it's just everything is just software, right? So it's like magic. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're we're really happy that you know we've uh, come to a point that we can actually you know 
collaborate at a global level, level, not just you know, uh, you know, focus on one region, uh, you know, in, in 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 the world. So that's that's enabling this, right? Uh, it's 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 equity at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in, uh, I mean, there is a great value, I think, to uh, to help with health equity with these solutions. Uh, but uh, at the same time, also to uh, realize, you know, that vision. I mean, we need to uh, to do like you know uh, solutions that uh, are you know very usable by patients. So we, that requires you know smart solution design. Also, on, in some cases, you know, it goes as far as making the technology. I mean, disappear uh, for patients uh, in the and try to you know work silently. You know, without you know too much uh, work on the uh, user interface uh, in other cases it you know uh, it requires to to find the right balance between the high tech and the high touch you know for example to uh, to combine you know technology with uh, you know good healthcare services being delivered by uh, you know care navigators or coaches on the phone also who have, have access to this data so you know we don't talk a lot about you know humans also uh, using the technology on the on the on the healthcare professional side but uh, i think what we're trying to to achieve in different you know therapeutic areas is the optimal balance in, between that, what the technology can achieve and what you know the human touch can achieve to uh, also optimize care in general. That was a great discussion. Um, I want to pivot slightly because we have only nine minutes left and I really want to get some thoughts on where things are going. So there was actually a question in the chat and this kind of leads really nicely into my next uh, segment is um, this one specific to Pierre and Lana. Given both your experience with smart monitoring dispensing devices, where's the interest in this in this space these days? Is dermatology dispensing an area that's popped up in your radars? And since it's dedicated to you and Pierre, Pierre, you're still off, I'll let you start. <laughs> I mean, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, I mean, uh, so for, 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 we have a, a few projects at the moment where we have, uh, you know, uh, dermatology uh, use cases on uh, also use of smartphones, for example, to uh, to monitor, you know, dermatology, uh, uh, you know, uh, effects of certain therapies on to uh, on to, see, to to track the evolution of that uh, over time through the treatment journey. So uh, yes, uh, on the second part of the question was device connectivity. So even though you know a lot of what we're de delivering goes through software as a medical device increasingly we connect to smart devices both on the sensing side so we now have more and more connectors to wearables and i think there is a good also an increasing body of evidence showing the value of, uh, of wearables in certain therapeutic areas uh, and secondly to drug delivery systems on uh, you know uh, now that we are volunteers has been uh, you know uh, uh, joining the aptar group i think we can go really far in uh, integrating the drug delivery system with uh, with uh, with a digital companion on you, you you can see early examples of that in the form of smart inhalers, you know, smart uh, injectors. Uh, so uh, the drugs, as we as we know them, when they have a, an administration route uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, powered by a certain device, you're going to see that more and more connected on dermatology is going to be an interesting area for that, I believe. So with regards to that, let's let's think forward. What areas of healthcare are needed in this digital disruption? Where do you see this going? We've talked step counts. We've talked sleep. Those are big areas in, in the world. We see um, things growing in that area. Where do you think we're going next with regards to what type of areas, uh, therapeutic and others, do you see this going? Mario, do you have any thoughts where things may be heading? I, I don't claim to be a... Uh, an expert in that field, we do see a lot of innovation occurring for sure. And I do want to jump on one of the thoughts that Lana talked about, and that's companies that can clearly articulate their differentiation is going to be important. And this is where we'll help companies use tools like Lean Canvas so they can articulate their value, why they're different, what they're going to provide. And so a lot of this is going to be how companies uh, have the ability to articulate what it is that they're trying to do so they can explain it to others and, and including the patient, but including investors and things like that. And so I would say in general, there's just, you know, one just common area that needs to happen is just electronic record sharing. I mean, right now records are everywhere and this gets back to the data question, of course, <laughs> but the records are everywhere. You know, the moment you switch uh, you know, you talk about the apps that are not, not yet integrated. When you talk about, you know, you're doing a, a, a particular procedure over here, and then you need to also 
do something over there? How do you get all of this data shared? And so in order to really merge to just the notion of a common platform, we need to ensure we're really thinking through about electronics you know, sharing of records, as simple as that may sound, this is a huge issue right now to, to try to get it all to come together. How to articulate that value is, is where we help a lot of companies because that's where they often have a hard time uh, crafting the experiment on a, what we call a canvas so they can really talk about who the patients that they're serving. Because even when we say the word patient, there's multiple different types of personas mm -hmm. of patients, right? And so we need to think through about that. And so just getting the platform from the beginning to craft what it is we're really trying to do with differentiators, who's it really trying to for, you know, uh, help, the channels we're looking to do it and the measures we're looking to validate against is going to be very important moving forward. Any others and what kind of digital where we're going in this space and thing excite you where you think we're going to go? So one area that excites me is, um, and maybe this has always been around, but we're not seeing it often enough, is when you do a head-to-head -head comparison of uh, how a digital therapeutic fares for improving patients versus how a digital therapeutic along with a coaching or a um, care navigator prepares and improves outcomes, the honest truth is 10 out of 10 times, if not 99 out of 100 times, uh, the augmentation of the human support amplifies outcomes. And I think as we evolve, even though it's, it's not necessarily um, uh, you know, regulatory clear how we're gonna do it, the honest reality is that having that additional support for a patient as part of uh, the evolution of digital care and digital therapeutics is here to stay because the evidence is overwhelming. And even though we're not necessarily talking about this, it is going to be coming front, front stage pretty soon. Uh, and I'm sure regulation will follow. So I would say that that would be something we all know is an open secret, but how do we get it into the mainstream and part of the adoption? Sounds good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Personally, I'm pretty excited about, you know, the advent of, uh, let's say, truly combined products, you know, between drugs, you know, devices on digital. I think you'll, you'll start to see, uh, let's say, more hybrid technologies, you know, combining, you know, the best of the molecule, the best of, you know, software, the best of hardware, and, you know, the best of data analytics, you know, all under the same umbrella. And uh, you won't even, you know, know, uh, you know, it's not, you know, part of the drug. I mean, it's going to be uh, the new drug. I think the pharma industry is going to evolve to add these capabilities and to develop let's say, augmented products uh, embracing this digital, digital technology. So I, I'm pretty excited about, you know, certain areas, particularly, I think, in specialty pharma in general, for example, I think, you know, it's, uh, we are going to see, you know, very personalized treatment experiences being delivered by pharma. On a, I, I think it's also uh, an opportunity to really continue to continue to innovate. I think in the space, what I what I like also to to, to see is the continuous flow of innovation in the space. For example, you have new mechanisms of action, you know, in the space of digital therapeutics. You know, new treatment modalities, new ways to uh, you know engage patients. On uh, it's really the early days, so uh, I, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll find very interesting new ways of uh, of caring for patients uh, in the coming years. Lana, do you have any final thoughts? Sure. I think for me, like the holy grail of, of, of things, like what I would like to see, and I think eventually it will happen, I think we're still years away, is kind of, you know, a, a, a small, you know, transdermal, you know, patch, I call it a patch, uh, that will enable you not to only monitor your glucose, but multiple biomarkers. And imagine how like revolutionary this will be. Uh, I mean, I, I was like, every time, like I need to kind of find stuff about myself. I need to go to the lab, uh, you know, have a full panel of tests. But imagine if you have that, like, you know, just, just there and then in a painless way that doesn't involve a, a, a needle where you can accurately ma measure all these, uh, you know, um, biomarkers uh, continuously. So for me, I think this is the future and we're, you know, uh, we're, we're not too far away, but we're, we're not, we're not too close either. <laughs> I have to agree with everyone here. I think what excites me is we, we like to call it multimodal or different types of things coming together, being able to look at summation. So a lot of the things we've done in the past have been very siloed, look 
accelerometry for this or this for this or you know very specific and i think what we're going to start to see in the future is integration of these things to look at a holistic type picture and i just see some really exciting things i know someone in the chat mentioned vr therapy i was sitting there playing with my kids in some vr games the other day and it was literally going oh think of how the medical applications we can use in this space understanding reaction times etc so i think we're uh, i want to echo everybody here and i know we're at the end of our hour um of how exciting a period we're in. Um, Mario, I love some of the techniques and ideas you're giving, and I definitely want to follow up with you later myself personally and some of the work we're doing. Um, but the excitement that we have in, in where we're going with this space and that we're in the early, early days of this, and I think it's a really exciting space. And I want to thank all of the panelists as well as MedCity for inviting us to speak. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed this hour. I know I have, and I will turn this all back over to Ruda. Carrie, thank you so much. And thank you so much to the panel for this excellent discussion. Uh, we have a little bit of time uh, to our next panel. So I'm going to, um, I mean, I can't help uh, resist asking this question of the panel. <laughs> we are discussing this later on um, uh, in the day today, but the idea of pharma and digital health having such different cultures, how much of a barrier is that to true collaboration? And I'll start with you, Carrie. <laughs> um, I don't think it's as big a barrier as we think. We're seeing that integration occur now. Um, I know I'm working with a, a number of companies in a number of spaces, and we're starting to see that culture change in pharma where we're starting to be able to integrate those aspects. So um, I think initially it was a, a thought process change, but we're slowly well, I wouldn't even say slowly. We're quickly bringing that forward. They're going to have some that are a little more slow than others, and there are going to be some quick adopters. I'd like to think we're a quick adopter. Um, but we're, we're really starting to see that need, and it's starting to go through the echo chamber. Some patients and others were hearing it. So I think we're going to see that collaboration continue, and if not, be amplified. Abhishek, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, we've been, I guess, one of the things that startups or digital health companies have um, is um, their, their, let's say, customer obsession. Um, and we decided in, you know, last year, um, and it was always there, but last year we really decided that uh, we're going to obsess about pharma as a customer. And the minute we did that, it was about um, really understanding, being empathetic to their work streams, their way of processing things. And what happened was, even though pharma may change a little slower, we as digital health can evolve a lot faster. And I found that that partnership really helps where we're agile, our frameworks, our systems, our way of operating, our contracting, the way in which we're solving, taking, you know, rather than looking at pharma and saying, oh my God, 10 heads, uh, how do we sort of align all of that? How do we look at it differently? Oh, wow, 10 different ways to look at the problem how do we integrate all the, those thought processes into the workflow? Because a lot of times we're seeing different stakeholders within pharma that just don't talk to each other, that only come to the negotiating table because that happens to be a conversation around a digital therapy or digital medicine, right? So just as we obsess more about our partner and make them the customer and then evolve the entire way in which we work to be more in tune with the way in which pharma works, I'd say that would be the other side of the equation uh, to be able to reduce the friction and increase win-wins because at the end of the day it's not about signing the contract it's about actually hitting the ground and achieving a win uh, and we've seen several successes of hitting contract wins but yet a lot more that needs to be seen on hitting real world on the ground wins and i think that's where uh, at least digital health companies are playing a role as well Excellent. So on that note, that digital health is sort of the unifying factor in pharma. I like that. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you, um, Mario, especially for sponsoring the panel and, and every one of you for coming and asking uh, interesting questions. Uh, our next panel is not until 1215 Eastern, where we will be talking about decentralized clinical trials and the evolution of the cl clinical trial space. So I hope to see you all then. <laughs>